That, that worked out right. I can brighten it up in, in GIMP or treat it if I get it. I hate GIMP. Just start off on the wrong foot. Oh, I love Krita. Oh, Krita, there we go. Yeah. Oh, uh, that reminds me. Um, yeah, where I heard it was the, the last podcast from Linux Format. They made they were talking about it, yeah, saying how good it was. Yeah, like uh, the Blender Foundation, like, they have that have like five users on the internet, <laughs> and so like uh, last year it was all my paint and all you know, and Alchemy, which is a really cool program. Um, this year it's all Krita. Mm. That should be interesting. Mm -hmm. um, Wonder of 3D2 introduction. Our speaker is Oscar Beck Beckler. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, even though I had a couple times. This, this session is an hour and 50 minutes long. It'll get over at 11.50. And at the end, unless you're at the, coming into the next session, which I don't think there's any in this building or in this class, at least, um, would you please clean up and leave that to you? And thank you. Well, hello. My name is Oscar Beckler. Don't worry about pronunciation. And uh, this is Blender, uh, the greatest program ever. Blender is a 3D modeling and everything. Hey, good to see uh, 3D modeling and pretty much everything program. Uh, if you think if you want to do something in 3D, Blender can probably be your solution. Um, and I truly do think of it as a poster child for how to produce an open source um, program. Uh, so this is going to be comprised of two sections. First, we're going to give you an overview of how 3D works and the overall pipeline of a 3D production um, and all the steps involved, all of which can be their own skill that you can do at a lifetime of mastering. And then second off, I'm going to do a live demo so you can follow along and you can learn the basics of Blender. I'm gonna, it's very beginner friendly. Uh, you can just dive in. So first off, some websites. Uh, if you go to blender.org, you can download Blender. I don't have internet here. I don't know, but. Oh, I could be on. We should probably show. Oh, yeah, well, maybe do. Linux best. That's if it's working. They, I guess they were having problems with the wireless, so they may have. Mm. Well, first off. Oh, okay. They said they were having our network and I said they were having issues with the, the wireless. Yeah, yeah. I just connected. Okay. Yeah. You can get Blender, Blender.org. If you want the super uh, hot builds, you can go to GraphicAll.org, which has up to the minute Blender builds. Users all over the world are building their own Blender and uploading them every 15 minutes or so. Uh, I think they've actually started using GraphicAll for other. Sorry, I'm using Windows. <laughs> uh, yeah, Blender 2.63 just came out, so if you just installed Ubuntu 12.04, you're already out of date. Uh, let's see, other websites of note, ogbog.net is my portfolio website. You can go there, there's stuff. There's pictures I drew for Santa Claus, any shade, other things. Um, and if you want, you can also follow me on Twitter and Facebook at Ogbog. And if you want, you can just pester me with questions about Blender. Um, if you can't figure out what you're doing, feel free to ask. Um, and also, Blender has um, a very good community for support, um, which is a polite way of saying they have poor documentation. Um, so if you want, you can often find users on the Twitter tag B3D. Um, and I think they have an IRC channel too, if you do that sort of thing. At least three. Yeah, yeah, they have a, there's, a, there's a Blender code on there's a Blender code. Not in the Blender channel. Yeah. All right. So what is Blender and how does it work? Blender is a 3D program that can cover every aspect of a 3D production. And I want to go over each of these uh, <laughs> things individually. The way that you produce something is um, you know, here's all the steps in 3D, but really, it's pre-production, post-production, right. oh yeah, and it's uh, in the middle, 
introduction. Um, and uh, you usually go in this, um, this manner. What does pre-production comprise? It's most of the stuff that everyone likes, um, and people get annoyed if you only exist in this. So it's the idea people. Um, concept art is here, um, figuring out your script. If you're doing a game, planning out what the main points of the game are. Um, and I'm just trying to nail down a schedule. Uh, Blender can be used for pre-production in certain senses. Um, it can even function as a um, image editor if you need to do concept art in there. So, new image, yeah, sure. You can go to paint mode. Now look at this. Dude. Take that, you. Um, and you can also use it for uh, certain other production, pre-production things like um, comprising your storyboards into an animatic, which is basically a, um, a film of your storyboards uh, that shows how a movie will happen. If you uh, buy lots of DVDs or torrent them, uh, you can usually find in special features animatics for movies. And it's a really good educational resource to go through. But let's go into production, so that's where Blender is really awesome. So the first step, step of production is creating a model. And you might be making a character model or an environment model, um, and all sorts of models in between. A model is essentially, let's, let's open a model example. Uh, I'll show you a project I'm working on. A model is basically a 3D representation of a mesh. So here you can see, if I go to the side view, I have this concept art. Uh, sort of um, what the project is going to be. This would be my pre-production, is drawing this up. Some sort of crab monster. He's got tendrils for eyes. It's really gross. Did and you draw that in there, or did you scan it in? No, this was hand drawing. Draw every day. There's no, there's no substitute for paper. Except, I guess, computers. <laughs> and so the plot of this is like, you know, this guy has like a little red riding hood girl riding on his back, and. They're going into a cave, and so basically, like, I think there's some sort of cool emotional element of um, this hideous freak monster being the guide to this little girl and into some sort of scary area. Yeah. Sounds cool. But mostly I just wanted to model this. So here's an example of a model. He's just roughly started. Um, but how do you make a model? Blender has several sort of tools for that. So for instance, I, um, I prefer what's known as edge modeling. And so what that would be is, <coughs> let me get this picture going. So what edge modeling is, is for instance, you can basically draw with verts. Um, and you can very quickly get the idea of what you want. It's starting to be a face. And then from here, you can start modeling outward. the start of a, a way that I would model, basically um, drawing individual strips of muscle as they sort of overlap the form. Let me show you an example of like a finished model. I am working on a Blender book, by the way, it's not out yet, so if you want to learn Blender, don't start yet. <laughs> and then, I your book. It's going to be learn Blender, Gimp, and Inkscape in 24 hours. Sam's Teach Yourself series. Cool. Yeah. So let's see. So here's a example of a finished head from uh, from my book. So you know, you can see where like. I was doing that same sort of thing with extruding the lips at, and eventually you get this. Oops, 
could be in it. And this was done with some concept art too, I believe. Uh, so, uh, another way that you can model is called box modeling. And box modeling assumes that you start with a, just a 3D box or whatever. And instead of sort of, I would say edge modeling is like drawing. And if you draw a lot, that's what I, you're going to be comfortable with. Um, box modeling is more like sculpting. Um, so, you know, you would start with this and you'd say, well, I need this to be to look like a human head. So we're going to start by extruding these. That's going to be my jaw. And this is going to be the neck. And eventually, um, we can cut. Out the nose. So that's basically um, two ways that you can really go about it. If you are beginning, I highly recommend that you start just trying to master modeling. Um, 3D is a very, very huge subject, comprised of many, many other huge subjects. Uh, and uh, it can be very, very discouraging when you jump into it. 3D is one of like the hardest learning curves out there. So. If you stick with modeling as like a primary focus for a little bit, that's going to help you digest a little bit at a time, and then you can go into figuring out, well, I have this model, how do I texture it? So what else do you do in production? So we modeled something, uh, and sculpting is the next thing we can do. Sculpting is really nice because um, you can get huge amounts of detail um, into a 3D scene. So. So here's a model that I've sculpted, uh, and this was actually a third way you can model. Uh, this was free sculpted off of just this cube. So if you look, um, you can see exactly how this um, advances. Here we have the basic form that I started with, which is barely anything, right? Um, you can then proceed up to like level two. You can see the level of detail we have. Um, and make so basically, uh, from this basic blob, I go up and then I start sculpting. And this is really nice because I'm not giving a crap about modeling yet. All I'm doing is sculpting. And sculpting is very, very fun. It's very relaxing. There's a lot less buttons you need to know. There's a lot less problems that can happen. Um, and so uh, this is sort of considered a reverse pipeline that's become more and more popular now that sculpting is more advanced and more computers can handle sculpting. So from here I would basically get the basic shape. I believe this is based off of a picture I drew. Yeah. I drew this and I thought it was funny looking, so I decided to bring it into a more advanced version. There's also something else going on with uh, sculpting, which is I'm cheating on the materials. And this is something that other sculpting programs like ZBrush and Mudbox do automatically. And you have to just set it up manually in Blender because Blender is, um, oh, whatever, it's good. Uh, so what this is, there is no real expensive OpenGL shading going on here. It looks shaded, but it's not. How is this possible, you ask? Well, this is a shadeless material, so in no way is a light coming down it's saying in the computer that there's a highlight here that takes a lot of memory, and there's no highlight here. There's a shadow getting cast, which casts a lot, costs a lot of memory. Like this. This is OpenGL fanciness. This is cheating. What I'm doing is I'm using a texture, which is just this picture, um, and I'm mapping it to the normal. And so, uh, essentially, any time, uh, any time there's a face that has that would be pointing downward. It's saying, use this downward pixel on the texture. Anytime there's one to the left or the right, um, use that. And you can see this if I go back down to, um, oops, I broke one. 
if I go back down to here, this blob looks almost like this material. And it's basically just saying that where this, uh, I think I can show you what a normal is here. Show normals. So each of these little faces essentially has a perpendicular line that is perpendicular to that face. And that's what it's using to shape it. So as a result, we have this one texture that's handling, that's making it look 3D, but it's totally fake. And as a result, we can get much more detail in our uh, sculpture. So eventually, uh, you know, this is starting to be the basic form of that picture I made. I then refine it, and it's important to get detail done early when you're sculpting. So uh, when I was uh, sculpting this, I made sure I had lots and lots of detail pulled in at the lower levels into the teeth because I knew I was going to have lots of, you know, nasty little crevices and monstery looking gums and gingivitis. And don't smoke, people. <laughs> uh, and eventually, I, uh, I know that at higher levels I'm going to be able to get that detail. But I'm already doing other forms of detail. I'm trying to get the major muscle groups in. I'm trying to imagine how skin is going to be stretched taut over muscles and bone and how it's going to hang loose. Um, he's got some sort of, you know, grandma flaps going to his neck, um, but also some sort of sternomastoid muscle here. Uh, and it's important to just, you know, it's good to draw lots of things. It's good to study lots of anatomy. It's good to look at creatures. Real life is the most realistic thing out there. And I start getting the eyeball. Um, I can show you some examples of sculpting tools really fast. So, let's add a multi-res modifier, which is how sculpting works. Multi-res. Subdivide, subdivide, subdivide. So, in sculpt mode, See, so yeah, I switched to sculpt mode down here. Uh, there's a couple brushes. Uh, brush, draw, and sculpt draw are essentially the same brush. They just have different presets on them. Uh, you can use the hotkey D to switch between them. You can see their settings are changing, but they're essentially the same. And all it does is it functions exactly like you would think. In sculpt mode, uh, you can, the two main things that you ever want to change are the size of your brush and how powerful it is. And you can always do that with the key F for the brush. Um, if you hit F, you get a marquee showing the size of it. You can make it gigantic. And you can make it really tiny. You can also hit Shift F to say how strong it is. So I can make this super strong, it's super big. And now you'll see it's really, really aggressive. <laughs> You can also turn on uh, X symmetry, and then when I sculpt on one side, it sculpts on both. Yeah. Very quickly, I can make a portrait of me. <laughs> Nipple eyes. Sculpting is really fun. When I have a bad day, I come home and sculpt. Other tools that are really handy are uncomfortable. Uh, other tools that are really good are the smooth brush, which is so important that you always have it by holding uh, control. So as you can see, all these verts are sort of right, shift is always uh, smooth. Um, you can also hit S to actually go to that brush. Smooth is really important because one of the most important modeling or sculpting techniques is to overdraw something. So I'll make this super strong. And then afterwards, <laughs> go back over the areas that transition with smooth. So you know, you you go too far with your sculpting and then you smooth it backwards. Another thing, let's go back to that head. 
Eventually, you're going to hit the point in sculpting where you can start going into extreme detail. And I believe in sculpt mode, this is set to level 7. And then you can start doing things like using textures. So I'll show you how that works really fast. I add a texture over here. Here you can see the uh, material world and brush. Yes, that makes no sense. But it's really cool. And now, I can use this as my method of sculpting. Very quickly, you can start adding nastiness. <laughs> it's a lot funner to make monsters than it is to make like pretty youths who have no wrinkles. Because on, on teenagers, they don't have any nasty stuff like this. Well, I guess they have. <laughs> the grab brush is also a favorite. However, you do not want to be using it like I'm about to use it. Um, since we have so much detail here, um, at this point, the mesh is so dense that when I grab, it's going to jam faces into faces. Um, and so you really want to be using it at level, uh, like a low level like this. But grab is really good because it basically lets you grab the whole overall form and move it. So for instance, for the purpose of sculpting inside of his mouth, I made his cheeks really wide. Here I could go back and know that that's done. Bring it back in. Well, let's do what that looks like. That helps. My custom artifacts. So now you can see these maps are gone. With some. It's more that, like, I want it to look like as he opens his mouth, that skin is stretching between this bony point and this bony point. That's the sort of stuff that, once again, you got you got to be drawing all the time. Good for you. So this is really pretty cool looking, and it's utterly worthless in production because if you look, there are uh, 1.5 million faces in this uh, mesh right now, which is utterly useless to anything. It'll never run on a computer. It'll take two hours to render. So what you need is a way of getting this data down to a more usable mesh. And you can use that using texture baking. Uh, so here I have a mesh that uh, I've baked lots of textures to. And now you can see this has a lot of that cool detail. It's got nasty wrinkles. It's got um, some color to it. And how many faces? 1,200. Very, very light. The way you get these is um, using modeling techniques called retopology. You can create a mesh on top of this mesh. So, so if I go to edge mode or vert mode, what you can do is stuff like you can use control to vert snap set down here. And you would essentially model this by hand over the sculpted form. And there's a few other tricks that I don't have time for. But in six months, buy my book. And I'll figure it out. Um, eventually, you're going to have enough that you can bake this down. So I'm going to select this mesh and then this mesh. And now we're starting to transition into this next section, which is texturing and material. So how does baking work? Well, first off, you use what's known as UVs, which is a science all into itself, uh, which is basically, the metaphor I like to use is it's like taking an orange, and you peel that orange skin off, and you flatten it down, and then you can paint a picture of a globe on it, and then when you wrap it around the orange again, it suddenly looks like an Earth. And very similar to that analogy, there's all sorts of problems that you have to balance against each other. You can flatten it better if you put more cuts in there, but those cuts are going to show up. Um, and additionally, if you have a limited amount of paint, you have to maximize uh, where you're dumping it on the orange. So eventually, 
you have UVs unwrapped, which are these things. And they work very similar to mesh editing. And now we're going to bake a map to this. The map we're going to bake first is a normal map. And what a normal map is, is a representation in pixel form of those little perpendicular lines that were coming out of a face. And essentially like well, a whiteboard. So if you have a square, each of these faces has a normal coming out of it, right? Uh, what normal maps do is it assumes that this normal has um, an x and a y and a z coordinate. It can go like this. It can go up and down from the face. And it can go like this, left or right. And that's its x and y data for the normal. And then its z data is basically, is it pointing this way, Boolean, or is it pointing this way, Boolean? Is it pointing in or out? You can represent this in a texture using RGB. So um, as a result, um, most of the time, if it's pointing out uh, directly straight, it's going to be 50% uh, x, 50% y, and This guy's kind of nasty a lot. So that's sort of how modeling um, and sculpting work to finally get a textured form on a material. Materials are another aspect of this. Uh, you deal with their diffuse color, their specular color. Diffuse being that sort of true color thing. Uh, but in my, uh, what you do is you end up mapping these textures to those. So instead of using this swatch for white, instead I'm using this texture that says, map it to the diffuse color. So that's sort of the idea behind um, how modeling, sculpting, and texturing work. Let's look at some other 3D things that you can do. The lighting is an important part of 3D. Uh, I can show you a scene I'm working on, I'm not done with it. Uh, oh, so many seeds. So this is a scene I'm working on for my book. Um, the idea is that it's going to be a hangar bay. All the modeling and all the texturing is going to be done for you. And your only job is going to be that you have to light it and composite. Um, so what you do in lighting is you have to do some sort of combination between accuracy and faking it for time constraints. You can see that this is already taking a certain amount of time. What's adding to this time? First off, uh, there's ray traced shadows going on. So a light is hitting the spaceship, stopping the light from continuing, and therefore it casts the shadow on the ground. It ha it's using multiple passes, such as ambient occlusion, which are going to make it more expensive. All of this is going to be multiplied over it to make it look dirtier and more shadowed in areas. And it's also doing certain other things like depth of field and the number of lights are affecting it. Rendering is often combined with compositing, which is uh, a very fun problem. Uh, what shall I show next? Uh, I'll just show it here. So compositing is a way that you can, let's say you render something out and there's things that you know you can fix if you just take it into GIMP and you, you blur something, you add like a soft Barbara Walters diffused glow on it, stuff like that. Um, if you're animating something over 100 frames, you can't do that for every frame. So instead you want to set it up in a way that it'll happen on every frame as you render it. And what you use is compositing. Blender has a node-based compositor, which I love, and is one of the best things about Blender if you've ever used a not node compositor, like After Effects. Uh, it's much more flexible, way more cool. Eventually, it's going to give us this render. Um, I'm not normally an environment person. I really like characters and monsters and people. Um, but I'm forced to do this. <laughs> um, but some tips for making an environment. Um, 
at a glance, it can seem really daunting. Uh, my suggestion is to look at lots and lots of reference photos and just get an idea of what you're doing. So this, this idea is, you know, it's a hangar bay for some sort of space machine. Um, so I looked at lots of, uh, you know, different sort of hangars, different warehouses. And then what I did is I just tried to compile a list of all the things that I could find that might be in this scene. So what do we have? We have fans, we have doors, we have interesting wall textures, um, giant industrial spool. This is a series of rectangles that are stretched out. You can then use cheating in Blender. I think I can show this wall it's rendering. You can cheat all the time in Blender. That's not really cheating. It's just fun to call it that because it sounds more devious. Uh, so this is actually this. All I did was model one half of one piece of scaffolding. I used a mirror modifier so that it happens on both sides. And then I used an array modifier to make it happen over and over. And this is everywhere in this scene. Look, array, mirror. Array, mirror. You can always cheat, and you should always cheat. Um, and so as a result, I was able to just start checking these things off my list. And I'm starting to get to the point where we have a 3D scene. So how does compositing work? Well, you would do things. First off, you can add as many different uh, passes to the 3D compositor as you want. If you go to the render panel, you can see there's all sorts of cool things that you can render. Um, for instance, you can render the normal, which is really fun, and then you'll have a pass that represents that, uh, that sort of data that I had that I was trying to explain here. So then you can in post add like you know a slight rim highlight to somebody's face, which is way faster than actually figuring out how to do it. Um, After you've done all this, you can start combining these passes uh, using something. It's, it's sort of counterintuitive when you start, but you should really just try to think of it as uh, a 2D image processor. And instead of layers, you have nodes. So for instance, how did we combine ambient occlusion on that texture, the little nooks and cranny contact shadows? In the texture, we were multiplying it so that it made things darker. Well, we can do the same thing here. Let's add a mix node, which is going to give us a layer mode transfer. You guys know about layer mode transfers? So in, uh, in 2D image processors and 3D image, it, it basically defines a relationship between pixels on two different layers. So the normal default relationship is one pixel is above and one pixel is below. This pixel is covering this pixel. Um, using a layer mode transfer, you can change that relationship to something like this pixel is going to make this pixel lighter whenever it needs to be, or it's going to make it darker. And the math is really fun for these um, if you look them up. So for instance, um, making things darker is called multiply because, you know, let's say we have a gray texture, which is 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 RGB. Um, and we're multiplying this over a white texture, which is 1, 1, 1. Uh, what's 1 times 0.5? 0.5. So it's made it darker by multiplying it. Similarly, what does additive do? 1 plus 0.5 is going to make it lighter. So you can look all these up. Um, so what we want to do is we want to multiply this overall image by our ambient.
by going color balance. And let's say we just want this to be bluer or yellower. You can start playing with these to get a really cool look, hipstamatic style, very fast. Um, if I can pitch somebody really fast, if you go to newsery.it, probably way beyond what you need to know. Uh, but this guy has a couple download files um, that give you uh, basically a thumbnail view of a bunch of things all at once. And so as a, as a result, look at this. This is essentially hipstamatic in Blender. Um, you run one thing into a node, and it outputs an image with uh, 15, wait, 4 by 6, 24 different options. And he has this for all sorts of different things, lighting, color correction. Um, and then you can end up uh, instancing these nodes into other things. And let's do one last distortion, if it's fun. Let's add a glare in there. That sounds fun. This is going to be really expensive and slow. But we can start. You can see it compositing down here. Look, we glared it. I cranked it up to a million so it looks shitty, but crappy. Um, look at that. Very quickly, you've got streaks. I like to say, change the angle to like 90%, and you instantly have Michael Bay. No, wait. Not Michael Bay. The lens flare guy. So that's basically the idea of a render, and all the steps comprised into it. But 3D is a lot more than rendering. Uh, there's also a lot of stuff to do with character setup, a scary subject for many people. How does character setup work? Well, let's create a character really fast. So let's say we have Mr. Q. He's calling me. So let's say we have a character really, really fast. just start animating him by going I for insert, I'm going to say location, we're going to jump forward 20 frames, I'm going to go over here, I, location, and look at him, he's animating, what a horrible animation. <laughs> Instead, in 3D, although you have that basic idea of how things transfer from one point to another. Uh, for advanced uh, animation, you end up using something called rigging. And what rigging is, is basically using a series of bones that have an interpolative effect on different verts. And as a result, the character moves around. So for instance, we have this bone here. We're going to call that our root bone. We can then say this is our leg. This is our arm, so on and so forth. Uh, I'm going to show you a much faster way of rigging, which is to use an auto rig. So this is uh, this is the auto this is the um, the Brigify rig designed by Nathan Vegdal. He is a local cat. Um, if you ever want to meet him, uh, speaking of which, I run 
CBUG, the Seattle Blender user group, and we meet every uh, first Saturday of every month. <coughs> CBUG.eventbrite. You can learn more. And Nathan Begdahl, Blender's greatest rigger. Uh, there's other cool guys. Uh, but he's always here. He's neat. And we learn lots of cool stuff. So next one, we're going to learn about more about compositing and lighting that scene, game engine physics, monster creation, and more. But so yeah, Nathan Begdahl did this along with some other Blender devs. And the theory is really fun, which is that most characters that are bipedal can be handled in a very simple way, which is just assuming they have a certain geometry. So very quickly, we can we can get our character with a rig. And uh, 